Our first speaker is Virginia Kuhn. Uh, she's professor of cinema at, in the divisions of media arts and practice. And she's associate director of the Institute for Multimedia Literacy at the University of Southern California's School of Cinematic Art, Arts. Her work centers on visual and digital rhetoric, feminist theory, and algorithmic research methods. In 2005, Kuhn successfully defended one of the first born digital dissertations in the United, in the United States, challenging archiving and copyright conventions. Kuhn has published several collections of natively digital, as well as more traditional book-based essays the most recent of which was co-edited with Anka Finger, and it is titled Shaping the Digital Dissertation, Knowledge Production in the Arts and Humanities, and it is in currently in production with Open Book Publishers at Cambridge, United Kingdom. Today, she will be presenting Embodied, embodied Rhetoric and the Fantastical. Welcome, uh, Virginia. Thank you very much for that introduction. So first, I would just like to thank the organizers for inviting me to this um, amazing conference. I'm really honored to be with uh, this group of people. So my talk today is titled Embodied Knowledge and the Fantastical, but the subtitle should be The Case for Lettered Orality. And indeed, I think if we embraced in the academy lettered orality as a form of knowledge production, that would indeed be radical. But before I talk about lettered orality, I need to tell a little story. In 2017, I was in a state that I can only describe as institutional desolation. My second marriage of 10 years was falling apart. My university was awash in scandals. My country was unfamiliar. The White House was full of people I did not admire. My country was locking kids in cages. And the Western medical industry was, uh, institution was a problem. I was having some medically ill, uh, odd issues. The last of which had been a, my left ankle, which I had somehow fractured and then continued to do yoga and hike on. So I was truly at the limits. I think I was heart sick. And I was at the limits of what I could, knowledge I could get in the standard institutional ways. So I had done research for many years on this vine. And this vine is a vine that's grown in the Amazon and it's ayahuasca. And ayahuasca is a, a plant-based medicine that includes DMT, and DMT is also called the God molecule because it occurs in every living thing. So I had done research on DMT for several years and I felt like that's where I needed to go. So I found myself a shaman and I started going to the desert. I, I did take part in ayahuasca ceremonies but also in fasting and in meditation and in cleaning the vessel so that you could hold space for the group. Ayahuasca is often called the grandmother or the medicine, and uh, often people see creatures <laughs> in ayahuasca. That's something that's never happened to me. So my first sit, as they call it, was in June of 2017, and I immediately integrated. By July of 2017, I was fully vegan. Um, I found I had been trying to recommit to my marriage and I found I couldn't do that. I realized I had to leave it. I had to be authentic. And also alcohol no longer was really working for me. Wine was not tasting good. And yet cannabis, which in my state is legal, was. So I truly integrated these plants or just a plant-based um, approach. And then a year in, I had what can only be described as a life-changing vision. And this, is, this image is about as close as I can get to it. I, was, um, I had the sensation of being with about a half a dozen people. They were very clearly there for me. They were my guides, if you will. They spoke to me without words, yet we did move. Um, we traversed the area. And they, um, I remember 
feeling kind of like the slow kid, like I couldn't keep up. And that was really liberating for me because, you know, as a professor, you're always in charge. And they told me that there was something direly wrong in my body. They told me that it was on the left side. They told me that my ankle was a placeholder, that it was a way to get my attention, which I totally believed because I never remembered fracturing it. Um, and yet the orthopedic had found the fracture. So um, they even went so far as to tell me a few ways that I would get rid of what was dire in my body. And they told me I would be just fine. And I remember at the end just thinking, please don't leave me. And they assured me that they never would. And in fact, that they never do. So I, at the time I was awaiting results from a, um, a colonoscopy five years earlier, I had polyps. And so the protocol is to take 32 snips from your colon, which I had done. And I was waiting for the results. And I was frankly pretty afraid. I thought I had colon cancer. I get to the doctor and she says, it's clean. You look better than it was five years ago. Clean was the word she kept using. And I thought, well, I dodged a bullet. I went vegan and that's why I'm okay now. So 90 days later, when a small fender bender, I was rear-ended on the freeway, where the shoulder harness was, the next day I was feeling and I found the lump. And this was a lump that would not have been found any other way. Um, when I went to my gynecologist and laid down on the table, it disappeared. But indeed, it was stage two breast cancer. And that lump was one lump. And there were several huge lumps in my left armpit. Now, I don't want to say that my spirit guides cured my cancer. Um, I definitely resorted to Western methods. And these women are integral to my recovery. Um, the first woman, Lee Moore, is my oldest friend in the world who is a cancer researcher at the NIH. And this other woman, Maria Nelson, made space for me on a Friday afternoon after my biopsy came back malignant and walked in calling me Dr. Kuhn and walked out three hours later with a hug and her cell phone number and a plan for cancer treatment. So I don't want to discount the fact, the role that Western medicine played in my recovery, but I also want to suggest the vital role that these women played. Melissa Etheridge, I had just heard years prior that Melissa Etheridge had breast cancer and was opting to use cannabis rather than um, opiates, which are so terrible on the system. I filed that away. Audre Lorde, I had read the cancer journals when I was in graduate school and in fact when my mother was dying of cancer. And I was fully prepared then. Lorde tells the story of a mastectomy and the huge pressure she was under to put a to reconstruct, which amounts to putting a fake breast, um, a fake bag of fluid that is so terrible for the human body and that essentially removes women's pain or makes it invisible. Surely I thought this would not be the case in 2019, but indeed it was. I faced a lot of pressure to put a fake breast in. I even had a female geneticist tell me uh, some women use this to get the breasts that they've always wanted, which there's so many things wrong with that statement. I can't even begin to uh, parse that. But I also want to, I cast a wide net. I, in, I incorporated um, uh, crystals, which are fractals. And this woman, Gina Zimmerman, is my longtime yoga teacher. And her, she had a corporal grace program, a, a program that incorporates the body as well as the mind. I did a retreat with her after my surgery and then a long one with her after my radiation, was able to get rid of some of the um, detritus that they wanted to do surgery for. And my case was medically remarkable. It looked like it was going to be awful, but I honestly think I was already choking the cancer off. So of the 27 lymph nodes that they removed, only one was malignant. I relied, Gina, I relied on this woman, Emota Ma, for, uh, she nurtured my mind and continues to do so. Um, Emota Ma suggests that in the 21st century, 
enlightenment, we cannot just go off on a mountaintop, but we have to live in our bodies in the muck and the garbage of the world. And how do we do that and stay enlightened? How do we show up even when we feel stupid and ugly and uninspired? How do we let ourselves stay calm in the depth and understand the surface ripples? I also did a huge, uh, several workshops with Liz Cook, who suggests that the psoas organ, which is the only organ that traverses both the upper and lower body, is the harbinger of a deep knowledge, a deep way of knowing. <clears throat> I, after my radiation, I went and took a class on Karandarismo, which is Mexican folk healing. And I'm at the University of New Mexico for two weeks with a colleague and they have these women who are 95 years old from Central and South America, they bring in who live next to a pyramid and they have all this ancient wisdom of plants. And this is when I really started understanding the power of lettered orality. In fact, we could capture the oral wisdom of these women and film it and then surround it with other types of information. And that would get us, would be a, a, an incredible mode of knowing. So I return to the work of Amit Gatswami, who I've followed for a long time, who is a theoretical quantum physicist. And his contention is that immateriality, in other words, thought, begets the material. And he's written several books I find scientifically and emotionally very impeccable, but he has a book called The Quantum Doctor. In it, he argues that non-Western and Western modes of medicine can harmonize and should harmonize. And this is when it became very clear to me that so can epistemologies. So my work for many years has been a springboard from Walter Ong's kind of seminal text of 1982 called Orality and Literacy, the Technologizing of the World, Word, excuse me. And for those of you who are unfamiliar, um, Ong charts the characteristics of oral culture, then of print literate culture, and then contemporary culture, which he calls residual orality or secondary orality. And these are some of the features of oral culture, additive, not subordinative, aggregative, uh, copious, um, empathetic, participatory. You can see that these are sort of non-academic ways of knowing, maybe feminine ways of knowing, or at least non-logical ways of knowing. So I suggest uh, an approach of lettered orality. I mean, we can never go back to oral culture and we never will have the innocence of not understanding print. I mean, print writing does in some ways change consciousness. But lettered orality, with lettered orality, we can combine the techniques associated with oral culture, such as rhyme and repetition. In other words, the affective along with features of literate culture, such as logic, abstraction, and statistics. And I think in this way, we can encapsulate all more ways of knowing. We can check them against each other. And we will resist the narrative of progress that suggests, A, that somehow the digital is distinct or superior to analog media, and really, B, that we will have a more, um, equitable society if we are only patient. So I am at the start of my thinking, I mean, I've written a little bit about lettered orality, but I'm currently teaching a graduate seminar titled uh, Embodied Knowledge in the Fantastical. So I just wanna give a shout out to these lovely human beings who are helping me think this through. Uh, I just took this the other day. Um, in this seminar, we are from, we were raised in five different countries on three different continents. And uh, they are incredible, brilliant human beings that are helping me think through these ideas. We're looking at the Integral Cinema Project and media shamanship, which I'm not quite certain of the approach here to media shamanship, um, but because it feels very Western to me. But on the other hand, we know that as vast consumption of media goes up, 
our students' mental health goes down. I mean, I encounter a lot of that. Uh, we're looking at the matter of vision in which Peter Wyeth argues that vision is our main way of knowing and that uh, we have this drive to create cinema. We're also reading the works of Terence McKenna who suggests that hallucinogens keep society from falling prey to their ego and greed. He also talks about edge detection, another visual acuity that really improves from eating certain of these plants. We're reading Aldous Huxley, um, who argues that our brain is just a filtering system that screens out all extraneous information just so we can survive in the world. But if we can bring down those barriers, we can know we can get to larger knowledge. But we're also looking at the work of Trinti Minha, who shakes up disciplines and exposes inherent ideologies, as well as the com comedy of Hannah Gatsby. These are some of the materials that I am now embracing. Um, for many years, my work has centered on remix. Now I'm concerned about remix outside <laughs> with material quantities. If we attended to this, we would certainly have more care for our stewardship of the earth. Maybe all junkyards could be sculpture gardens. Uh, Grass is Greener is a documentary that shows not only shows the science behind a cannabis and also the inherent um, uh, sort of racism that took part in this country to start calling it marijuana to associate it with Mexicans. Um, also, we're reading Lisa Feldman Barrett's Seven and a Half Lessons About the Human Brain, in which she argues that the brain evolved as a resource management and not just for thinking. She also argues that when we're in groups, our brains sync up with each other. We are more collective. We are not individuals. And lastly, this isn't from Feldman Barrett, but neurons have been found in the brain, the heart, and the stomach. And yet, we proceed as though we're, they only rely on the brain. We teach as though the brain is all that matters. And when we focus on the brain to the exclusion of the body, we elide considerations of race, gender, ability, age. And when we focus on the brain to the exclusion of the body, we cut ourselves off from the people outside the ivory tower with whom we should be, for whom we should be advocating. So I don't know exactly what the pedagogy of lettered orality looks like, but every time I tell this story, every time I end a graduate seminar with a Sanskrit prayer, every time I attend to my undergraduates, whole beings, their, their emotional, their spiritual, and their physical well-being, as well as their academics, I feel one step closer to a pedagogy of lettered orality. Thank you.